Praise the Lord. Welcome everyone in Jesus' name. By the way, you know, there are no other pastors who are joining us this time. We're all in Khan and PFN. You didn't say amen to that. And so it's not a deeper life uh, program. And then other pastors are coming to join us. Deeper Life and all the other churches were all in the Christian Association in Nigeria. And so we're all together. And I pray the Lord will bless us together, even today in Jesus' name. He reveal his mind to us. He reveal his will unto us. And he'll give us his word. And his word will prosper. And the ministry will prosper in every hand in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you at this time and worship you. We bless your name because you brought us together to sharpen us, to develop us, to train us, and to lead us where we ought to go in the ministry. And we pray, Lord, that your word will sink into every heart in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless us so that we can become instruments and sources of blessing to the congregation we lead and to the world, the community around our congregation in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, that your word will bear fruit in our heart, in our character, in our devotion, in our ministry, in our local churches, and all around in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God shout, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We've been talking about the church. Because that is the place we have ministry. We've been talking about the body of Christ, which means it's not just a local church. It's not just a denomination. We're talking about all the branches of the church, the body of Christ. And we're talking about the foundation of that church of the body of Christ and we're talking about the very cornerstone of that church which is the body of Christ and as we come and understand that Christ is the cornerstone and Christ is the foundation you want to build your life you want to build your calling you want to build everything you have on that foundation on that cornerstone and it is only that that makes us part of the church and makes us part of the body. And as I pray that the body of Christ will be solidly united and solidly grounded and founded upon this cornerstone and upon this foundation in Jesus' name. Which means then that as the whole church is built upon the foundation and Christ is a cornerstone, the cornerstone of our salvation, the cornerstone of our steadfastness and the cornerstone of our steadfastness and usefulness, profitability in the kingdom of God that everyone will make sure that he is and she is solidly built upon that foundation and I pray that nothing will take you away from from the foundation or shake you away from the foundation of the church in Jesus name today we're looking at another aspect of the body of Christ and Christ the connection that we have with Christ with the Savior with the cornerstone and the connection we have with that foundation of the church and the topic is the sure foundation and cornerstone of the church it says you see the church is there and he is the cornerstone he is the foundation of that church and so you know we're talking about a person is the redeemer is the savior and without him none anywhere in any congregation without him none in any denomination can be saved because he is the foundation he is the sure foundation. He is the cornerstone. He is the precious cornerstone 
of the church. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me, here is Paul the apostle, a master, a, a wise master builder, and he had been used of God to lay the foundation. And then he says, according to the grace which is given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another build this thereon. It says, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Then it says in verse 11, telling us what that foundation is, who that foundation is, and that foundation is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's been from all eternity. It's still living at present at the side, at the right side of the Father, and he continues to live forever because he is everlasting. And then he tells us, for all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid. Whether in the past, at the time of the apostles, or now, in our time, or in the future, until Christ will come, there is no other foundation. It says, for all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. It's still the foundation. Now we're coming to First Peter chapter 2 and we're looking at verse 6. In First Peter chapter 2 verse 6, therefore, it says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. He said, it is contained in the scripture. Why is the apostle saying that? He said that if this came and you cannot find it in the scripture, don't believe it, don't accept it. If this one comes from a kind of a, a present dreamer and a present prophet and he says, you cannot find this in the scriptures, but I say he has no authority. You have no authority. I have no authority except the authority that is given in the scriptures. That's why it says, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. A chief cornerstone. This is the cornerstone of salvation is the cornerstone of every experience we have in the Lord. And it says, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. And the people of God said, The sure foundation and cornerstone of the church. We're looking at three points here in the message. Number one is the incomparable Christ, the head of the church. No other head, no other director, and no other pathway, no other pathfinder. This is the head of the church, the incomparable Christ. You cannot compare him with angels. You cannot compare him with any man from Adam at the point of creation until now. You cannot compare him with Moses, with Joshua, with Aaron, with David, with Solomon, and with the prophets. They were his messengers. He is incomparable. You cannot compare him with any family of any church, any denomination today. You cannot compare him with any prophet, any evangelist. You cannot compare him with any powerful one because he is Christ. And so you don't want to plant your faith, your confidence, your trust on a man much, much lower than Christ. You don't want to pin your faith on any angel because this is the incomparable Christ, the head of the church. Number two is the indispensable Christ. If I don't have him, I can have this. You can't get to heaven if you don't have him. You can't get to the will of God and to the very center of the provision of God if you don't have him. Without him, we can do nothing. He is indispensable in life for salvation for progress and for our calling. This is the indispensable Christ, the hope of the church. Number one is the head of the church. Number two is the hope of the church. Number three now is the indestructible Christ. The indestructible Christ. Ideologies cannot destroy him. 
Opinions of men cannot destroy him. Resistance cannot destroy him. And all the things that the world may do, the world under, the world over there, and the world here, the world on the left, the world on the right, the world of philosophy, and the world of ideologies, this is the indestructible Christ, the heir for his church the heir for his church that means the one that inherits all things and inherits all things for the church one incomparable two indispensable and three indestructible well look you are taking them one by one number one he is the incomparable christ the head of the church in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 22. And has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head. Look at that. He gave him to be head over all things to the church. And then in verse 23, it says, which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, when it says Christ is the head of the church, now, what do you think about that? We just say that and we don't uh, really think about it that Christ is the head of the church. What the head is to the body, Christ is to the church. And what's the function of the head? I'm going to use uh, that word and the letters in that word head. That's H, E, A, and D. He is the heart of the church. The heart of the body. The heart in the body is the very center. And the one that gives life to the body. And what the heart does to the body Christ does to the church. He is the head, he is the heart. He is the healer of the body. He is the helper of the body. When you think about Christ and you think about him as head, you are thinking about him at the very center, at the very heart, as the helper and as the healer. And the E there, the E, he himself said, he is the doorway by which we enter and find the Father. And so he, he is the head of the church at the entrance to the body. He is the emancipator of believers. You come to the Lord and he is the only one. Emmanuel that can set you free he is the emancipator of the believer he is the establisher he is the author and the finisher establisher perfecter of our faith that's what it means when it says he is the head of the church he is the advocate we have an advocate with the father and his name is jesus christ is the propitiation for us so when you think about the advocate you understand he made the at atonement for us and because he is the head of the church he is the one that makes the atonement and it is because we believe in the atonement of christ that's how we enter the church and that's how christ becomes our head now when we say advocate there, there is a word we use in our normal language we say is the attorney is the attorney is the one that stands before the father and is the one that is pleading for us and pleading our case. And when you take that word, attorney, there's something we call the power of attorney. What that means is that somebody uh, who is uh, maybe the manager, the director, and the leader of his uh, company organization, he calls you and he says, now I'm going to give you the same power as I have. What does that mean? You will be able to sign for the company in, uh, you know, in my absence. And when you sign anything, because we've gone to the court, we've settled it, and I give you the power of attorney. 
Whatever you sign is like I've signed it. In my absence, I give you all the authority and you do what needs be done. He gave us the power of attorney. Now he went to heaven and he said, in my absence, whatever you say, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth you is loose in heaven because you have the power of attorney. Because you are redeemed by the atonement of Christ, because he became your advocate, because he became your attorney, and because he has now given you the power of attorney. The deed there, he is our deliverer, is the head, and he doesn't allow anything to come into the body. If the believers in the body will believe him, the deliverer of true believers. Look at four things in this point one. Number one is the heart of the body. Number two is the entrance into the body. Number three is the advocate for the believers. And number four there is the deliverer of the true believers. Look at them one by one. He is the heart of the body. When we're thinking about the heart, I want you to look at James chapter 2 and verse 26. It says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so Faith without works is dead. The point there is the body without the heart. The heart has stopped functioning. The heart is not transforming or the heart is not transferring, distributing and making the blood to flow to the rest of the body. The heart is disconnected with, from the brain and because of that blood is not flowing and the grace of God for the church is not flowing into all the parts of the body, literally that body is dead. That means then uh, as we're talking about the body of Christ and Christ is the heart of the body. Christ is the one that makes all the grace, all the strength, all the power, all the vision, all the hearing, everything of the goodness of God from heaven to come into the body. If you are disconnected from Christ, if you don't have Christ, if all you have is ritual, ceremony, tradition, harvest time, and all the other things, and you are not connected with Christ the Savior, literally that part of the body is dead. That's why it says that the heart or the body without the spirit, without the heart is dead. And so you check up on yourself. You're a believer. Are you? Are you connected with Christ every day? The grace you receive, the virtue you receive keeps you alive. If that connection is severed, then that fellow is as good as dead. I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 4, reading from verse 23. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Out of it are the issues of life. The heart is so central. The heart is so important that you have to keep that heart and keep united with that heart. Once the vows connect in, uh, you with the heart or the heart or the rest of the body, then uh, all the issues of life cannot be flowing, cannot be functional. And once the issues that connect us with Christ, our faith, our dependence, our trust, and our confidence in him. Once that is disconnected, we're as good as nothing. Because out of it are the very issues of life. In John chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 5, it says, I am a the vine, and ye are the branches. See the connection there. It says, when you believe, when you trust in him, he is the vine, and we are the branches. And then it says, he that abideth in me, and I in him. It's like the heart, the heart abiding in the body. And the body, the body is keeping the heart intact, then it says you abide in me and I in you. It says the same. Bring it forth fruit, much fruit. For without me, 
ye can do nothing. You understand? Without Christ, he is the heart of the body. And without him, we amount to nothing. We produce nothing. In the sight of God, we're actually a big zero. We might have title, we might have a position, we might have skill, we might have whatever, whatever natural thing. But without Christ, the Savior, without Christ, the cornerstone, without Christ, a foundation, without Christ, the promise keeper without Christ we do nothing we are nothing and whatever we do is not reckoned with in heaven each thing of the head he is the heart of the body we're looking at he the entrance into the body the emancipator of the body the establisher of the body and of the believer. It tells us in John chapter 10, reading from verse 9, I am the door by me. Not by Peter, by me. Not by Paul, by me. Not by St. Augustine, by me. Not by the founder of a local ministry, by me, by Christ. If any man enter in if any man by him because he is the door into the kingdom of god he is the door into the body of christ it says by me if any man enter in he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture and then he tells us now in um, it tells us in chapter 3 of John, reading from verse 3 and verse 5. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, truly, truly, assuredly, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, is been born naturally once. Again, he must now be born supernaturally. And except a man be born supernaturally, born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then in verse 5, in verse 5 it says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, is the washing of water by the word. And then it says, and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Entering into the kingdom, becoming part of the body of Christ, is by being born afresh, born anew, born spiritually. And the spirit of God works in that person. The spirit of God gives him conviction, conviction of his past life that is not ready and worthy of heaven. And then it gives him the heart to confess. It calls before the Lord, Lord, I see my emptiness, I see my shallowness, and I see my deadness, and I come to you because you are the only one that has the power. You are the only one that has given the promise. You are the only one that gives the provision that I can be born anew, born again, and born from heaven, and I can have the nature of Christ in me. It says the Spirit of God that gets that done. It tells us in verse 36 of that same chapter, he that believeth on the Son has as everlasting life as you repent you're convicted as you confess and you tell the lord you are dead without him and as you hold him in confidence and you trust him and you say i believe i believe i trust in you that you are my savior and you made the provision for me so that i can be born afresh and born and new born again and born of the spirit i you believe that he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. And he that believeth not, Nicodemus, 
a ruler among the Jews, if you believe not, he that believeth not, the one that said, where our father is Abraham, he gave us this well, and we have been drinking of this well all these many years, woman, he, she that believeth not, a person that says, I've been in the church, I've been in religion, I was born in the church, uh -huh, because somebody was born in the garage, he claims to be a car. No, it doesn't come by the natural birth, it comes by the spiritual birth. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, eternal life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. He is the heart of the body. He is the entrance into the body. He now he is the advocate for the believers. Advocate for every believer. And then when all those believers come together, he is the advocate for the body. Look at First John chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 1. First John chapter 2 verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, if anyone sins, maybe he's been born again. And then he goes back into sin. And then we'll say, my friend, it's like you've gone back to your old vomit. It doesn't matter. I'm saved. I'm saved. Friend, looks like this is backsliding. And you're like the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter, the prodigal preacher, the prodigal pastor. And you've gone back into old ways. It doesn't matter. I'm saved. I'm saved. Said no. If any man sin, he must go back to the Lord. He must go back to the advocate. He said, we have an advocate. He is the one that made the atonement. We have an advocate. He is the attorney. He is the one that will receive you and present you to the Father and he will say, he is mine. Yes, he sinned, but he has returned. He has returned from the far country and he believes in me afresh and therefore your advocate, your uh, your attorney, he now gets you linked up with the Father. He says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And then in verse 2, in verse 2, he tells us, and he is, present tense, he is from that time at Calvary until the time that John was writing to the church until today, he said, he is the propitiation for our sin. If the one that cleanses our sins, if the one that takes our sin away from the presence of God, if the one that takes all those sins and puts them in the sea of God's forgetfulness and they're no more remembered against us because he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world because he is the advocate. We're looking at uh, Romans chapter 5. I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 1, it says, therefore being justified by faith, we have, we have, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 2, it says, by whom that Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus who has become our Lord, that Jesus who becomes uh, the, the one that directs us, it says, by him also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Then in verse 11, in verse 11 he tells us, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom, look at this, by whom we have now received the atonement. The atonement. He makes atonement for us and we come by faith to him and we have the atonement and because of that, he becomes our advocate. He becomes our attorney. And when Satan says, look at what you did in the past, our advocate, our attorney shuts him up. He's the accuser 
of the brethren, not of the sinners. He does not accuse the sinners because there is property, there is people. And whatever they do, he keeps quiet. But when somebody becomes a believer, a real child of God, then he wants to use what happened in the past, what you used to be, where you used to go, what you used to drink. And he brings that against you. And our advocate is silencing the enemy and the accuser of your soul in Jesus' name. Well, we have looked at him, Christ is the heart of the body. Christ is the entrance, the emancipator, the establisher of believers in the body. He is the advocate. He made the atonement for us and he is our attorney. He has even given us the power of attorney and now D is the deliverer. The deliverer. Christ at the head of the church is the deliverer of the church. Is the deliverer of the body. Is the deliverer of every believer in Galatians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 4. Galatians chapter 1 and we're looking at uh, verse 4. He said, who gave himself for us, for our sins, that he might deliver us. That he might deliver us. You know, if we don't believe that Christ is the deliverer, and we leave him at the corner there and he's saying, I am your deliverer. Come over here. I'll deliver you. We say, no, no. I know somebody that has a deliverance ministry. And you understand? All these people, deliverance ministry, deliverance ministry, they, they say they are delivering us from uh, whatever spirit. Some, uh, they have given names to those kinds of spirit. They say there's territorial spirit. They say there is a generational curse. They say there is this kind of spirit, that kind of spirit, and he has the deliverance ministry. Can I remind you, we don't find that in the Gospels. We don't find anyone specializing and he says somewhere there, and you know, people had been directed to him, to her. He has, she has deliverance ministry. No, we have the gospel. We have the good news. And when Christ died on the cross of Calvary, he delivered us. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. Acts of the Apostles from chapter 1 to the end, chapter 28, we don't find a deliverance minister that is somewhere that, you know, everybody goes to, everybody goes to. If you're going to have deliverance, go to him. There's nothing like that in the Acts of the Apostles. Everywhere those apostles went, when the people were saved, those people were delivered. They were set free. All the chains and all the shackles of the enemy, they were taken away from their lives. You come to the epistles, you come to uh, Romans and 1st, 2nd Corinthians and Galatians. You do not find, you know, some Somebody stays somewhere. Now Paul cannot do this. He's an apostle and he is to preach the gospel. And then Peter and James and John cannot do this. They do not have this special meaning. There's somebody in the corner there that has a deliverance. It's not preaching salvation. It's not preaching transformation of life. And it's not preaching how we get to heaven without holiness. No man shall save the Lord. He is there for deliverance. And then the things that deliverance means the things he does and the kind of uh, rules he gives to them. And then this, I say, sir, deliverance minister, where do we find that in the Bible? No, this is my experience. I was in that, uh, you know, cult before and then I was delivered and this is what I did and then I've modified it now because of the various experiences I have and I tell them to do this, I tell them to drink this, I tell them to go to the crossroad at 12 12 o'clock in the night. Don't miss it. 12 o'clock in the night. And then you kneel and you face this area and you do. There's nothing like that in the scriptures. It tells us every, everything he did when he called Moses, he gave Moses the power to do and to provide everything the whole nation will need. And when he called Joshua, he gave Joshua everything the Israelites will need. And you go on like that you don't find anybody that is a special deliverance minister. Christ is my deliverer. Christ is my deliverer. 
And when you make Christ like him, like her, if I don't go to her, if I don't go to him, Calvary will not work. Christ cannot work. Christ is so associated with this deliverance minister, except I go to this person, even the work and the provision of Calvary means nothing. Isn't that blasphemy that we think that we have to get to that man and that woman before Calvary can be effective? Christ is your deliverer. And it will deliver, of course, he has even done it. Look at Galatians chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 4, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. Somebody shout Amen. In Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 13. It says in verse 13, who has delivered us. It's not that he's going to do it, he's done it already. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness? He has done it and he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And then in verse 14, in verse 14 it says, In whom we have, not that we are going to have, we have it already. And the moment we believe and we have confidence and trust in him, it says we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Now we have treated point one. He is the head of the church, the heart of the body. He is the entrance, the way in to the body. And he is the advocate, the attorney, and he's made the atonement for us to be part of the body. And he is the deliverer of the body. As we believe in him, we're delivered, and every yoke is broken in your life in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two, the indispensable Christ, the hope of the church. The indispensable Christ, he is the hope of the church. In Colossians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 27. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, to whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Christ in you. The hope of glory. It tells us in First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 3. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3 it says, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again, born again, has begotten us again, born again, spiritually, supernaturally from above. Now we are born, begotten of God, into a lively hope. It is by that salvation, by that new birth in Christ that we are begotten again, we are born again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Christ, the indispensable Christ, the hope of the church. Again, we are going to use those letters H O. P -E, that we understand when it says it's the hope of glory. We want to understand each there is the husband of the body. Look at that lady, single lady, and whatever she has, if she's single, and people are saying it was the hope of perpetrating all that you have. No husband, no child, but when she gets married, is the hope that all the things that had not been fulfilled, that she could not fulfill all by herself because she's linked with her husband. Because of that now, there is hope. And then, oh, is the overcomer for the believer. Christ said, because I overcame. You too, you will overcome. Christ, the overcomer 
for the believer and be there Christ is the power of God in the true believer Christ the power of God in the true believer and he is the exemplar is giving us the example. It's the model. And he is the exemplar. We're looking at Christ, looking unto Christ, the author and the finisher of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And because he is the exemplar of the body, then all the body will follow after and begin with H.H. H. He is the husband of the body. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5, and we're looking at verse 23. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as, even as Christ is the head of the church. He's talking about the husband, he's talking about the head, and he says, Christ is the head, the husband of the church, and he is the savior of of the body. He is the savior of the body. That's the body of Christ. You come to Christ and you're part of the body of Christ and whatever happens there, you go back to Christ, the husband, the provider, the lover of the church, of the body and everything that we need it will supply in Jesus' name. Look at verse 24 there. Verse 24 tells us therefore as the church is subject unto Christ so let the wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. You remember? He's talking about Christ and it says Christ the husband of the church and we are to submit to him in everything as the wife submits to the husband in everything if a minister if a preacher if a pastor if a bishop if an archbishop says by my position this is what i tell the church the body to do and i will say sir with all due respect uh, that is not in the bible and says shut up young man when did you become a leader in the church? And you are telling me that this is what Christ wants. I say, as the bishop, as the founder, as the overseer, as the superintendent, this is what to do. You know, we are mistaking our position as leaders and we are usurping the authority of Christ. Christ is the head, the husband, of the church and it says as the wife is submissive subjected to the husband in everything so the church whatever branch of the church whatever denomination whatever block in can christian association of nigeria whatever branch and whatever part we are to submit to Christ, the husband of the church. We're not to play syncretism. And we're not to play idolatry. And we're not to take the position of Christ and push the Bible aside and say, this is what we do. And this is what the founder of our denomination commanded. We must not usurp the authority of Christ. It says in verse 25, in verse 25, husbands love your wife even as Christ also loved the church. It's talking about husband and then it's referring us to Christ every time and he gave himself for it. In verse 26, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. In verse 27, it tells us, it says that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. That, that's the intention of the Lord and that's why Christ gave himself so that the church will be holy and pure and without stain, without sin, without evil. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm reading from verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, it says, For I am jealous over you, with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband. Not two husbands, 
one husband. Not two husbands, Christ and another shepherd over there. He is the husband, not a husband. He is the husband. And Paul the apostle said, by my preaching, by my ministry, by my intercession, and by everything that I do, I have brought you and espoused you to one husband. And then he said that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He mentions the husband and then now he says, I'm talking about Christ. I have a word you, I've won you, and I'm a teaching you and warning you so that I can present you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. He is the husband of the body. He is also all there in the overcomer of for the believer. The overcomer for the believer. It tells us in John chapter 6 16 and verse 33. John chapter 16, verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. You will have peace. Peace in your spirit, and peace in your soul, and peace in your life, and peace in every situation of your life in Jesus' name. It says, These things have spoken unto you, that ye might have peace. In the world, he shall have tribulation. It's not talking about the great tribulation. It's not saying that the believers will pass through the great tribulation. And after they have suffered the great tribulation for seven years, then I'll come for the church. No, he comes for the church before the great tribulation. Noah was in the ark, safe and preserved, before the waters of the flood began to fall. And the Lord and the family were taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah before the fire of judgment came on Sodom and Gomorrah. So, as for the great revelation, I will not pass out the, the great revelation. Say it for yourself. The Lord will come, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and then we which are alive will be caught up together with them, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. It's talking about the trials, this verse here, it's talking about the trials, the temptations, the difficulties, the challenges we have while we're still here waiting for the coming of the Lord. He says, these things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have a tribulation. That's what happened in the Acts of the Apostles. They locked them up, they beat them, and he told them not to speak in this name. That's the trial, that's the persecution, that's the tribulation. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And because he overcame, you'll overcome. Look at First John chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 13. First John chapter 2, we're looking at verse 13. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. You have overcome. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. Verse 14. In verse 14, I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. And uh, I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong. And the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Somebody shout amen there. In First John chapter 4, I'm looking at verse 4. In verse 4, he tells us that First John chapter 4, we're reading from verse 4. It says, ye of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you. You are a believer. At the point we are going to become a believer, I said, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, 
I will come in. He abides in the believer and he says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You will overcome in Jesus' name. H is the husband. O is the overcomer, and P, he is the power. The power of God in true believers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading from verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 24. It says in 1 Corinthians 1, and verse 24, And unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks. Those who are called, they're called to repentance. They're called to righteousness. They're called to salvation. They're called to holy living and faithfully see who has called you who also will do it. And as he has called, and we respond to that call, it says, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because he calls us, and because we have responded, and we come into Christ. And through that we come into the body. We find that Christ is the power of God. And that's what it means to be the head. When, so, when, the, when the head has all the thinking faculties, and all the vision, and all the plan, and all the things that God has given us, then the body will be strong. It's the strong and powerful head that gives a power to the hands and the feet and every part of the body. And they then you are able to move and able to do what Christ would have done if we were here in the flesh today. He is the power of God. And we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, reading from verse 9. 2 Corinthians, we're looking at chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. He said unto me, and what he said to Paul is what he's saying to every believer that he has sufficient grace, abundant grace, and overpowering grace, and enabling grace, energizing grace. He says to me that my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in wisdom. Most gladly then, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities and the natural deficiencies. It says that the power of Christ may rest upon me. In um, Ephesians chapter 3, reading from verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according, according to the power that worketh in us. And then in verse 21, it says unto him, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout out all ages world without end and everybody shout yeah. uh, that that means then when he says world without end the power he manifested at that time world without end still continues that means that there is no age there's no generation there's no dispensation where that power of God has taught. He says that power, Christ, because Christ is still the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. He says Christ, the power of God in the believer, the power of God in the church, in the body. That power still continues until, until the end of the age, throughout all ages. He says, world without end. And the people of God shout, Amen. Amen. Well, we're coming to the last letter there. H for the husband. O for the overcomer. P for the power. And E for the exemplar to the body. Exemplar for the body. We're looking at uh, First Peter chapter 2 and I'm reading here from verse 21. It says in verse 21, for even hereunto were ye called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving 
us an example. You're a believer and something is happening now and there was to be your response to that, your reaction to that. Look at Christ. He left us an example. Something is happening in your family between us and and wife and then, you know, somebody is so angry and then uh, he has animosity and they are not in talking terms and they cannot look at one another. There is anger that prevails in the family. If you're a believer, what are you to do? Looking uh, unto Christ, the example of Christ. You're in a place of work and the people decide they're going to kind of siphon and take money away surreptitiously, secretly, without anybody knowing. And they say you're an important part of this, uh, you know, of this gang of people. What do you say? You look at Christ. They say, but this is going to give us millions of our currency. And nobody will know this, will cover it up, and nobody will ever say anything about it. If anybody says anything, anything about you will get rid of him and then you say i cannot be part of that why not because i'm a christian and we go to church too where christians do no because i have link with christ i'm born again i'm a child of god he is my example whatever is happening anywhere and whatever people are deciding they're going to do and they're saying they're Christians too they say they're born again too they say they're preachers too they say they're Christian workers they say no not like that it's because Christ is my exemplar he is my example and he says for even here unto what he called because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps and i pray every one of us by his grace by his enablement will follow the example of christ in jesus name it tells us in first john chapter 4 and i'm reading from verse 17 first john chapter 4 we're looking at verse 17 in verse 17 it said herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment look at this look at this because as he is as he is is not fraudulent it's not a liar it's not a deceiver it's not plain hypocrisy before the heavenly father as he is as he is he says so are we in the world as he is he is our example he is a perfect model and as he lived and as he is even now so are we in the world here is our hope because christ is our husband because christ is our overcomer he's the overcomer for us and because christ is the power of god in us and because christ is our perfect example we're coming to number three now point number three we're looking at the indestructible christ and when we belong to his body, the church of God in Christ, it says upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church and against the members of the church. Amen. The gates of hell shall not prevail against me. Amen. See it for yourself. When you are planted by Christ, when you are built by Christ, and when Christ himself puts you in the body by that new birth, and that there is a great, indivisible, indestructible association with Christ, then as he is indestructible, you are indestructible. After all, your spirit belongs to God. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And because you belong to God through and through, he is not destructible. You are not destructible. And your blood will be poison to the devil. And your blood will be poison to the messengers of the devil. You're preserved and nothing will cut your life short until you finish everything you have to do. Yeah. 
What does that mean? Uh, when you are writing, uh, you write something. If there is a T there, when you draw that line, you have to cross that line to make it a T. When you write an I there, you have to dot that I before you go to the next word. Am I right? Until you cross every T. Until you dot every I. Until you put a full stop in that sentence, nothing will take your life. Yeah. And nothing will take the ministry away from your hand in Jesus' name. Yeah. Now we're talking about this. It's the indestructible Christ, the heir for the church. The heir for the church. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 1 and we're looking at verse 2. Hebrews chapter 1, reading from verse 2, he has in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. He has appointed Christ as the heir, the one that inherits all things. He tells us in Matthew chapter 16, and I'm reading from verse 18. Matthew chapter 16, and we're reading from verse 18. It says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Somebody shout, Amen. Amen. Now, the air, again, we're going to use the letters of that word, H E I R. Uh, it, it tells us, H E is the heir of all things. And then he is the expositor of all concerning the bridegroom. You know, the disciples, they were following him, and they didn't know all that concerned Christ, the heir of all things, and he had to expound unto them, expose to them, exhort them. He had to be the expositor of all concerning uh, the bridegroom. And then I there, he is the intercessor for all believers and are uh, the restorer of all things for the body. He is the heir. He is the expositor, he is the intercessor, and he is the restorer of all things. He will restore everything he has provided for us in Jesus' name. Look at, look at number one there. H is the heir. It tells us in Hebrews again, chapter 1, reading from verse 2. He has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Whom he, the heavenly father, whom he, whom he the, the overall, the most high, and the one that has all power, and everything comes under his authority, he has appointed him as heir of all things, heir, inheritor of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. I want you to know that now that Christ is heir of all things, we're joint heirs with him. Because he tells us in Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 17, Romans chapter 8, verse 17, and if children, then heirs. He is the heir. And he is the foremost heir. He is the first heir. And he is the predominant, preeminent heir. And as we come to him now, we become joint heirs with him. And he says, if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. And joint heir with Christ. You understand that? And us branch, before she, he ever got married, he had all this property here, all this property, all that bank account there and all those things over there and now he gets married to the one and only wife to the one and only bride and that bride no it wasn't she wasn't there when the man had all this property all this bank account all this company and everything but now because 
She is the bride because she is the one and only wife. She becomes heir with the husband. That whatever the husband has amassed, has collected, has had, this wife now has everything with him. That's the church because the church is the bride of Christ. And since Christ has become heir of all things now, then if we're his children, if we're part of the body, we're heirs, heirs of God and joint ears with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. It will be fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. And in Revelation chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 7. Revelation chapter 21, verse 7, he that overcometh shall inherit all things how many things are you going to inherit? All things. If we are going to inherit all things, so back there, we need some strength here. I need to inherit some strength here. We need some grace here. I need to inherit some grace here. We need some power here. I need to inherit some power here. We need some strength here. And we need to inherit that strength here. We want to inherit some of these things that we need now. When we get over there to heaven, we'll not need any power over temptation. There'll be no temptation there. We'll not need any grace to overcome sin. There'll be no sin over there will not need answers to prayer because everything is provided over there is over here we need all the solution and we need all the grace and we need all the strength and we need all the power and it says we shall inherit all things from today you begin to inherit and every need of your life will be met in Jesus' name. It says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. I thought the sons and the daughters would say, Amen. And number two here is the expositor of all concerning the bridegroom. All concerning the bridegroom, you know, when husband and wife, when they come together, during the courtship, the, uh, the lady will think that she knows a lot about the husband, but you don't know 1% of the life of that man, of the property of that man, of the authority of that man, of the goodness of that man, of the possibilities in that man. It's after you get married now and then you are now in fellowship you are discussing together and uh, you know I didn't tell you when we were cutting but you know I have a house in America I have another one in England I have another one in Germany I have another one here in Nigeria and then I have uh, you know companies here and then you begin to open the books because you are now together and begins to expose unto you everything that he has and then you have one question all these that you have uh, is there any co-signatory with you in all this account he said i was waiting for you that when you come then you'll be the co sick now that you have come uh, and he gives you this account and it takes you there it takes you there and he exposes everything to you give me a good amen. amen now you come into the kingdom and Christ the expositor as the bridegroom he now exposes everything to you we're looking at Luke chapter 24 in Luke chapter 24 I'm reading from verse 27 and beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. There are people who are Christians, they don't come near Christ enough to have the exposition from the expositor and to tell them here as your savior, as your sanctifier, as your Lord, as your bridegroom, here is what I have and I have them all for you. And as you come near, as you draw near, you'll see everything he has and everything will be to your benefit in Jesus' name. And then we come to verse, verse 27. We've read verse 27. Now we're looking at verse 32. In verse 32, it says, and they said one to another, 
didn't our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures he opens the scriptures to you to know this is what he at the head at the bridegroom at the husband at the healer at the hope of the church this is what he has and this is what belongs to you look at verse 44 in verse 44 and he said unto them these are the things are the words which i spake unto you while i was yet with you that all things all things all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of moses and in the prophets and in the psalms concerning me he is the one that expounds everything unto us i he is the intercessor for all believers and that's why he is the heir and he is the one that makes available to every believer and to the whole body of christ what belongs to the body through him the intercessor hebrews, hebrews chapter 7 reading from verse 25 in hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 wherefore he is able in your life wherefore he is able in your family wherefore he is able in your ministry wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto god by him seeing knowing understanding that he ever liveth to make intercession for them do you know he's praying for you i said you know he's praying for you that water will not drown you he is praying for you that fire will not burn you up he is praying for you that enemy will not crush you he is praying for you that intimidating intimidating thing that makes you panic and you're afraid and it's a seed can i take another step you'll go over you'll get to the other side because he christ is praying for you he is the intercessor we're looking at uh, romans chapter 8 and i'm reading from verse 32 romans chapter 8 we're looking at verse 32 he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely 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 give us all things look at verse 34 in verse 34 it says who is who is he that condemneth it is christ that died yea rather that is risen again who is even at the right hand of god who also tell me maketh intercession for us now look up here when Christ was on earth, Lazarus was dead, and Christ was here, and the Father in heaven. By the way, the Father and the Son are not the same personality. There is the Father in heaven, and then at that time, Christ different distinct separate was here on earth and people say you know the father the son the holy ghost they are the same personality is jesus that is called the father is jesus that is called the son is jesus that is called the holy ghost no when jesus went to the river jordan to be baptized he jesus was coming out of the river and the holy spirit separate came like a dove and uh, lighted upon him and the voice of the father far away in heaven also spoke this is my beloved son in whom i will please the father the son and the holy ghost the three distinct divine personalities but they are one but not the same personality and then christ was on earth and god in heaven and then on earth he looked up and said father i know that you have heard me and after that he said lazarus come forth 
Why am I telling you that? When Christ was far away on earth and then he spoke to the Father in heaven, God always answered. But now he has moved from earth and he's right there. He just turns like this and he said, Father, heal him. Father, deliver him. It's no more like far away here on earth and he's praying for you. He's sitting by the right hand of the Father and he's saying, Father, strengthen that man. Have a great, great ministry for him as his days, so shall his strength be. Father, look at that, my daughter. Look at that woman. I've appointed her to do something that no other person can do. And she's getting weak. She's getting weary. And she's saying, can I go on? And she has sickness in her body. And she's by the right hand of the Father. Just sit here, just turns and say, Father, look at her. Then, yes, I can see her. What do you want me to do for her? I want you to strengthen her as if she was never sick in her life before. And this is what the Lord will do because because he is now at the right hand of the Father and is making intercession for you. For me. For me. You will not fall. All the powers of hell will not be able to destabilize you in Jesus' name. He is the intercessor for the believer and for the body. And he is the restorer of all things for the body. The restorer for all things for the body. Acts of the Apostle chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted. That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come. Are you weary? The times of refreshing has come. Are you tired? Are you, are you dried up? The times of refreshing has now come from the presence of the Lord. Then in verse 20, in verse 20 it says, And he shall send Jesus Christ, who before was preached unto you. Verse 21, in verse 21, Whom the heavens must receive until the times of, that word there is the word restoration, restitution, all all things that have been prophesied, all things that have been provided, the times of restitution, the times of restoration of all things is the restorer of all things. Every promise of the Bible, every prophecy of the Bible, every petition in the Bible, everything the body of Christ is asking for, the solution and the answer and the restoration of all things. It says the times of refreshing will come and it is the time of the restoration of all things which God has spoken but the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. I do something, you know, I do it, I will say virtually every day. What I've done is I've recorded all the promises of God, Old Testament and New Testament. And all those promises, I put them on what we call MP3 and then it treats it to me. The PDF is there. The write-up is there. All the promises are there. And I study different parts of the Bible. I listen to whatever. But every day I take all those promises. I'm reading them. Every day I'm taking those promises, I'm listening to them, it's a record there on my, on my tablet, and then I soak in the promises and I know all these promises that were given since the world began, and I'm refreshing my mind with them every time, and when something happens that, you know, might uh, have the possibility of jolting me, of shaking me a bit, I say, be steady. Be cool, be steadfast. And then I bring the promises back to my mind. And I say, Lord, restore this one. Refresh this one. I said, give this one. And because my mind, because my heart, my life is taught, has taught up all those promises from Genesis to Malachi and from Matthew on to Revelation, I literally lay by thinking and by believing all those promises. And I send it forth to you. The promises of God will be yes and amen in your life. 
You turn this way, a promise will be fulfilled. You turn that way, another promise is fulfilled. You move forward, a promise is fulfilled. There's trial, a promise is fulfilled. There is a challenge and the promise is fulfilled. You'll be the personification of the fulfillment of the promise of God. I believe. I believe. Rise up and tell the Lord. It's restoring everything to you. It's granting you everything. And you will be a personification of the fulfillment of the promise of God. Open your mouth now and talk to the Lord in prayer. And say, Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. He is Christ. And he's incomparable. He is Christ and he's indispensable. He is Christ and he's indestructible. Receive him. Let him be the power of God in your life. He is the head of the church. And because he is the head of the church, he is the heart of the body. Is the heart of the body and let him be like the heart unto you that is sending forth all the provision of God, all the goodness of God, all the grace of God, all the enablement from the Lord that Christ in me, Christ in me, Christ in me, the heart of the body. And tell the Lord, tell the Lord that he is the emancipator, tell the Lord is the establisher, tell the Lord is the entrance. You are the entrance into the body. Entrance into everything that the Lord had made available. And tell him, I believe you, Lord. You are my advocate. I, I believe, Lord, you are the atonement for me. And you are my attorney. And you have, you have given me the power of attorney in my life. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord. And say, Lord, heart, mind, soul, body, I release myself completely unto you. I won't go anywhere you not want me to go. I will not do anything you don't want me to do. I will not, um, you know, have any association. If those people don't have any association with you, I'm going to belong to the Lord completely, entirely. And I absolutely, absolutely surrender myself and submit myself unto you. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord he is the deliverer of the believer he is the deliverer of the body and if you'll tell the Lord oh Lord deliver me from that look at this pain and look at this attack and look at this affliction I take you as my deliverer tell you, it must be a personal decision a personal faith a personal trust a personal confidence in the Lord that you are saying, O oh Lord, you are unto me. You are unto me like the heart. And the heart will transfer every good thing to my life. Make everything all right in my life. And then you are my emancipator. You are my establisher. Establish me on the ground of faith. You are the foundation. And you are the cornerstone. Let him do it in your life. And tell him that you believe. That he is your advocate. Satan cannot accuse you successfully. If you will surrender yourself to him. And say Lord you are my defender. Lord you are my deliverer. Lord you are the all in all in my life. In the morning I will hold you as my heart. The entrance into the goodness of the Lord, into the fresh revelation of the Lord. My advocate, my attorney, you made the atonement for me. Accept that. I believe that. I rejoice in that. And you deliver me. You defend me. And Lord, I know that no power on earth, no power from hell, no power from anywhere, and destroy the one you deliver and defend. And he is the hope of the body. He is the hope of the body. He is your husband. And as the husband protects, preserves, directs, so he also will do. Tell the Lord there will be no separation between you and the Lord. 
tell the Lord that uh, there will be no need that he, the bridegroom, and the husband will not supply. He will supply every need of your life. Tell him, and as the wife is obedient and submissive unto the husband in all things, so your life will be lived in submission to the Lord in every detail. In every small thing, in every big thing, you are totally submissive unto him. He is the overcomer for you. Challenges will come. Challenges will come. But he is the overcomer. Like he overcame, you'll overcome. You'll overcome temptation. Overcome trial. Overcome difficulties. Overcome all the hindrances and the blockages that the enemy might put before you. You are always, always triumphing through Christ. He is the power of God. Power of God. Think about that. Power of God greater than the power of man. The power of God greater than the power of any enemy. The power of God greater than the power of Satan. He is the power of God in man that will submit to that power. And you know that whatever, whatever, whatever may happen in the village, in the town, in the place, in the city, in the ministry, in the community where you are called to minister, where you are called to serve and to walk. That power of God Christ abides in you and nothing will bring you down. Nothing will destroy you. And he is the example. He is the exemplar. He is the model that he walks before you and you follow in his steps. You follow in his steps. What will Christ have done in this situation? That's exactly what you do. What will Christ have said in this situation? That's exactly what you'll say. And how will Christ react, respond in this situation? That is how you respond or you react because he is your exemplar. Your model. He is the one that walks before you. And he says, as I do, so will you do. As I stand, so will you stand. As I endure, so will you endure. As I live in every situation, because he is your perfect example and perfect model, that is how you live. He wasn't afraid of Satan. You'll not be afraid of Satan. He wasn't afraid of Pharisees, Sadducees, religious people. So you'll not be afraid. As he would speak, so you will speak. He is the hope, the husband, the overcomer, the power. The example and is the enabler, the one that enables you to follow after his example. And how he is the heir for the church, the heir is the helper, is the healer, the heir, and they will become with him. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. He is the expositor. He is the one that takes the scriptures and expounds them, explains them, apply them to you so that your understanding of the scripture will be like his understanding because he the bridegroom, he expounds, he explains, he exhorts with that scripture. And everything concerning him 
he exposes to us so we can have uh, the benefit of what the scriptures are said concerning uh, him the expositor and his intercessor is praying for you he knows your need he knows your concerns he knows your desires he knows your aspiration and he knows your passion what you want and because the passion the desire line up and they align with the desire of the Lord in your life is taking that to the Father. He's saying, Father, answer him, answer her. And he is the restorer of all the promises, the fulfillment of all the promises that have been given since the world began. Tell him, and accept him fully, the head, the hope, the heir. The head, take him your head, let him direct you, let him define who you are, what you become, what you do. The head. He determines what you do. He determines where you go. He determines what you accomplish. The head. Let him be your hope. Your hope. No discouragement. No despair. No unbelief. No going back. No looking back. Christ in you. The hope of glory. The air. Everything you need is in Christ. Everything you desire is in Christ. Every promise you want fulfilled is in Christ. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And he that spared not his only begotten son. But he gave him up for you, for me, for us. How shall he not with him also give us all things as we abide and remain in Christ? Accept everything is provided for you. And know that he has freely given us all things. He has freely, fully given us all things as yes, freely fully finally giving us all things trust him Abide in him. Rely on him. Unite with him. What he has, you have. What he has provided, you have. All the provision he gave at Calvary. All the promises that have been made since the world began. Everything now available for you. Accept. What the word says. Believe what the word says. Enjoy what he has provided.
to every promise of God, to every plan of God, to every declaration of Christ, let the church say, Amen. amen. To the promises, say, Amen. amen. To the provision, say, Amen. amen. And to the prayer intercession of Christ, for you say, Amen. amen. I want you to always remember that when you think your prayer is weak, Christ acts his prayer on top of your prayer. Amen. This is the way I understand it as a mathematician. That your prayer looks like he's zero. And then Christ's prayer is that I stand in integral. And he puts that one beside your zero. And it becomes ten. And so I say your prayer, well, the prayer of Christ is no more zero, is ten. If there are two of you praying and as you agree together, and you say, I even thought his prayer would be stronger than mine. His own also looks like zero like mine, and mine also zero, and zero, zero. And we bring in the prayer, the intercession, I for intercession. We put the one of Christ, we put it zero, zero, and then there's one backing them up. It becomes like what? Your prayers are answered. Where are you? Raise up that hand and say, Lord, I know today. If my prayer was not answered before today, to, today, today, my prayer is answered. Yes. Father, in Jesus' name, yes. we thank you, we glorify you, we bless your holy name. You are God in heaven. You put us here on earth to do something spectacular something spiritual something special and lord we are praying and we bring the prayer of christ beside our prayer we know hundred percent we are answered in jesus name every impossibility in the life of any child of god here any minister of god here any preacher of the gospel here lord i pray impossibilities become possible in jesus name answer to every prayer solution to every prayer deliverance for every prayer healing for every prayer grace abundant grace for every prayer sufficiency for every prayer and lord i pray you make every brother every sister every preacher every pastor every bishop every leader in the church make them a solution to the problems of the world and I pray, Lord, as we move on, we always remember, always remember, he is the head, he is the hope, he is the heir for the whole body. And all this that we have learned today will be translated into fulfillment in every life in Jesus' name. Make the weak strong. Make the blind see. Make the dumb sharp. Make the foolish wise and make the one crawling stand up and walk in the way of the Lord and make the idol industrious that now we will work. And the work everyone does, brother and sister, your work will bear fruit for the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Nothing will push you down. Nothing will destroy your life until you cross every T in the ministry. Until you, uh, you dodge every I in the ministry. Your life is preserved. The provisions are all available for you. You are going out now this morning to go and succeed. You are going out to go and overcome. You're going out to go and triumph. 
God cannot fail. And God will never fail you. When you come back, you are coming back from te for testimonies. And Lord, I pray for all your people, all your workers, all your ministers. I pray what they have not been able to do before with this realization we have in Christ now, you will do, you will accomplish, you will overcome, you will bear fruit, much fruit, more fruit in your life, in your family, in your ministry, in the church, in Jesus' name. Go win the world for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray.